don't need to be nervous yes. at all. This is a really awesome community. You can just chill and take your time. And um, Thomas, I think it's brave of you to be broadcasting live from what looks like a safari park. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Carl, for your uh, introduction. Uh, and do you see only the presentation? Do you see uh, the presenter's note? Is it okay? You see only the presentation. <laughs> but it's very good because... Uh, We're seeing I, the slides, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, only the slides, good. Yeah, because I, I need to rely on my presenter, the presenter's note, particularly today, because I had... a. Uh, uh, two morning classes uh, in the morning. It, it's just one hour difference from Sydney. So it's three o'clock in the afternoon in Japan, but uh, I've already had classes and uh, I am speaking after that, Thomas, I need to spare enough time for Thomas to speak. Otherwise I might uh, really get slower or speak too much. So uh, I am going to rely on the notes uh, in order to make sure I keep time and enough time particularly uh, for you to engage in the discussion uh, because of the topic that we're going to be presenting today. So um, thank you everyone for coming to this round table and thank you Carl for giving us this great opportunity uh, for us to speak here. Uh, today, um, my name is Ayumi Inako, co um, teaching at Kobe City University of Foreign uh, Studies, and Thomas Amamra uh, teaches at uh, Nara University of Education. Uh, so we are going to present as LCT Japan, and LCT Japan is a relatively small and young group, but is an enthusiastic group. Uh, we are both fascinated by L LCT, and uh, today we are going to to organize a presentation in a slightly different manner from what is generally be done in previous round tables. Uh, that means suddenly we're going to talk about our own research. Uh, I have my own research topic and Thomas does one. Uh, however, uh, they are going to be kind of uh, being embedded in the overriding topic of localizing LCT. So this means that um, here's the outline of today's presentation. First, I'm going to introduce the concept of localizing LCT, and I'm going to introduce to you what happens and what we do in Japan in general. And then uh, that will take um, the stage of uh, introduction, if you like. And then um, Thomas and I actually take turn. I, I will take the first turn to present on my own research. Then Thomas is going to take um, his turn to present on uh, his research. And then uh, at the end, Thomas is going to lead uh, the discussion uh, regarding the challenges and strategies in localization. So uh, of LCT here, you already have the nominalization uh, local localizing activities kind of fucked up uh, as a noun. Uh, but anyway, uh, that is going to be our presentation. And remember that regarding our research, uh, both of us are in an early stage of um, our own research. And in many cases, what we discuss together uh, while we are preparing for this round table is that in many cases, we hear a lot of presentation about the, um, the achievements on uh, a, a large scale uh, research project uh, using LCT. Many of you have done PhD using LCT and so on. However, we are not. We have just started out using LCT. Uh, so it, it is in that term that we call uh, LCT Japan group as a young group, uh, but uh, I'm uh, always encouraged, and today I've already been encouraged by Carl's word, but uh, Carl, you have always been saying that round table is uh, a place for discussion, so uh, I'll be counting on that word and counting your uh, accounting on your collaboration uh, regarding uh, giving us uh, constructive feedback and comments and so on. Uh, so, um, and 
we are happy to, and actually uh, we are excited to present uh, what we are trying to do. So uh, that is our plan. So can we move forward? And let me begin by um, first uh, localizing LCT. So this is a kind of, <laughs> little schematization I made uh, in terms of how localizing LCT can look like um, based on our own experience, but try, trying to kind of generalize from there. See, so uh, firstly, uh, localization means, uh, of LCT means that we are uh, playing the role of one the researcher uh, using LCT uh, in our research uh, and or using LCT as a teacher. And uh, at the same time, and in addition to that, we'll be uh, using uh, LCT to, uh, I mean, not really using, but uh, taking the role of promoting uh, LCT and these roles of promoter, teacher, um, researcher uh, need to interact with each other all the time. And then uh, when we do this to uh, localize LCT, uh, as you, the recontextualization is a common term uh, in this community, I guess, but when we take um, each of these roles, each time we have to go through the process of recontextualization, which means understanding of general concepts and how they are used, and also understanding of local context and how uh, these general concepts fit in to the local context. And then so negotiating between the two things. And um, all these uh, individuals are challenging. And uh, particularly when we are uh, new as a researcher, teacher, promoter, uh, when we're new to the theory, which actually we are. And so uh, there are a lot of challenges that we have been facing. However, there are a lot of positive side to it. Uh, so uh, actually in the case of LCT in Japan, uh, we are, as I said, both relatively new to LCT in the sense that we didn't use LCT and a PhD. So if you use a theory in your PhD, that means you are trained into uh, using that theory. Uh, but then uh, if you haven't, then you have to learn um, the framework, how they're used um, on your own. So uh, that's... Uh, um, big uh, big deal. Uh, however, Thomas and I have a lot of things uh, in common, actually, because uh, for one thing, we have a common uh, background in SFL, and we have a common context in our working situ in terms of working situation. So we are both working in the English as a foreign language context. And also, uh, we have a kind of shared problem, which uh, is English for examination, uh, which is prevailing in uh, Japan, uh, Japanese uh, education of English. And we kind of have a complementary perspective on this uh, important uh, problem. That, and we, we see that as a problem, this one thing we, that are uh, shared among us. And then we kind of have a, a complementary perspective on that. Um, uh, myself, as a teacher in university classroom, I teach uh, students just uh, graduated uh, who came out from the secondary EFL classrooms in which uh, English is taught for um, with a lot of focus on um, university entrance examination. Thomas, as a teacher educator, uh, look at secondary English uh, classrooms and lessons. And he one of the big issues he sees is that uh, teachers uh, need to uh, cater students with how to be successful in the exams. So, um, 
English for examination or what is called Jukain Ego in Japanese. Uh, this is a huge issue. And uh, we're going to, uh, talk, uh, Thomas is going to talk about that and the dilemma and issues involved uh, around this context uh, will be also be discussed in the later uh, part of this presentation. But so uh, in, in, in short, uh, as teacher and researcher, uh, we have uh, some uh, aspects in common and uh, sort of complementary perspective of shared problems. So that is what we are. And also uh, we have been uh, working uh, towards promotion of LCT, particularly in the last few years. Uh, but starting from 2018, uh, in 2018, I did a number of presentation, including uh, one in Boston and uh, some others in Japan. Uh, Thomas did uh, his presentation um, um, many times in uh, 2019. And we also co-published an interview from Carl uh, Mayton uh, in early 2020 with another colleague of us, uh, Dominique Esta, who is unfortunately uh, unable to come to this session. Uh, so we've been working uh, on our best. And we have actually planned a workshop, which uh, was unfortunately canceled in 2020 due to COVID, but um, some workshop uh, will be planned. And uh, we are kind of riding this uh, new wave of LCT 3.5, etc. In order to uh, get connected with um, other local groups, and in that way uh, promote uh, LCT um, in Japan as well. So uh, issues, dilemmas, challenges uh, involved in there will be discussed later. So this is the context in which uh, we try to localize LCT in Japan. And this is the introduction part of the presentation. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about my own research uh, from here. And it, uh, it is about summary writing in tertiary English reading classroom, okay? And the general context in uh, English uh, of English teaching in tertiary education in Japan is a mixture of EAP and EGP. Uh, that is because many academic subjects are uh, generally taught in Japanese. Uh, some universities um, uh, go move towards um, uh, doing academic subjects in English. However, that is uh, still rare cases. And depending on the curriculum of each school, uh, some schools or some curriculums focus on English uh, for academic purposes. Uh, others focuses on um, English for more general purposes or spe more specific business oriented perspective. And another thing uh, that is common in tertiary ed uh, education in Japan is knowledge is uh, divided in, since secondary school system, uh, again, uh, due to the huge event uh, after graduating from secondary school, which is a uh, university entrance examination. So in secondary school, usually courses are divided into two, uh, one uh, towards humanities and social sciences, which is called bunkei in Japanese, and another, the other one uh, towards rikei or nat natural science, technology, medicine, etc. And I am interested in bringing in uh, natural science uh, topics to humanities and social sciences uh, students. So that's uh, what I'll be talking about in my uh, talk today. Now, regarding my own uh, teaching context, uh, which is Kobe City University of Foreign Studies, it's a relatively small university uh, with only one faculty of foreign studies. Enrolled students is approximately two, three, 2000 something, uh, which is very, very small. Uh, however, locally, it has a pretty good uh, reputation, again, from the test score. And uh, in Japan, usually um, university rankings are uh, 
calculated regarding the expected standard deviation score against the average score for the university entrance examinations. And uh, usually uh, our universities is located around 68, 72, which means the students come, who come to this university is on top uh, two, 3% of uh, all the university entrance exam takers, uh, including those who fail in entering any universities. But um, it's not the highest, but among the relatively high. And this means uh, students come uh, with, uh, who comes to this class uh, is relatively confident in their English skills and uh, with a high motivation. And the classroom uh, I'm focusing on is one uh, conducted uh, second semester last year uh, in the Department of International Relations. And it is a first year English reading course. The first semester was taught by another teacher. And uh, we have two classes of 47 students each. It's, it's a, lot, a lot of huge number for uh, uh, language classroom already, uh, but teaching online was quite a challenge. And uh, in the beginning, I started off by doing synchronous uh, classroom, and then I needed to switch to asynchronous classrooms uh, due to my uh, capacity issue as well. It was too tough. But uh, I've been teaching this course uh, in the second semester for a few years now. And uh, I've been using uh, this material reading and vocabulary focus for from National Geographic Learning uh, Sengage. And National Geographic is known for um, provider of popular science of magazine and all videos and all those stuffs. And uh, for means it's the, it is a textbook for um, learners of English as a uh, foreign or second language, but level four is the highest. So um, I uh, adopt this because uh, students have uh, high motivation and uh, relatively high English skills uh, in, uh, in Japanese um, uh, standard, at least. And here is the schedule. Uh, I'm presenting this one uh, just as a uh, already revised, but um, this is how I conducted the course. I spent two weeks time for one reading uh, in this course. Uh, but I, until previous years, um, when I was teaching only on face-to-face, -face, uh, I was teaching one reading per week, uh, one by one. That was because the student was really highly motivated and they wanted to read a lot and they wanted difficult content. Give me a difficult one. However, uh, they were satisfied if they do um, reading comprehension exercises and uh, all answers get corrected, uh, all correct answers uh, without mistakes they uh, assume that they understood the content. And so, okay, this is easy. The questions are easy. I understood everything. I know the vocabulary. What is the next one? Just like that. But I was not really satisfied uh, with the way I taught until that time. And I did some uh, wrapping up kind of ex uh, exercises at the end of each reading, uh, such as um, group discussion and so on, but it didn't really work so well. So when it turned uh, to online course, and it was the second semester, so in the first semester, we learned that we needed to slow down if we teach online. We cannot uh, do everything we used to do. We need to focus on what exactly we want to teach in uh, each of the particular course. So I decided to take two uh, class times for one reading. And then I thought about mm, what do I do to consolidate the student's understanding? And the concept of summary writing 
came really out of nowhere. So, okay, at the end of the, each um, reading, you're going to write a short summary. But then uh, some of the students really got excited with the idea of this short summary because they have had this concept summary writing uh, somewhere else. And okay, we're going to do summary writing in this course. I am so excited. So uh, what is the due date? Uh, do I submit this week or next week and so on? So I, I thought, oh my God, how, how can I cater these students? However, I also had the brief understanding that I, if I know SFL and LCT, I find the way out. So, and uh, really, uh, my um, respected um, supervisors who already had written a great paper on summary writing and lots of work has been done, and I'm with, I, I was able to do that. So, this, this was a schedule, and we did three summary writing uh, until uh, by the mid. Um, middle time of the semester. And then uh, after that, uh, I gave some summary feedback and assigned to them to revise one of the summaries they've written. So that is uh, what we did in this course. And now I'm um, just briefly talk about the theoretical concepts I use. Um, general from SFL and semantic gravity from LCT. And the informing literature was Hood uh, 2016, uh, where she um, combined the concept of general and semantic gravity in exploring ethnographic methods in the humanities. So here's the network of time uh, order story genre and semantic waves, uh, some of them uh, that she had in her paper. And uh, initially I was thinking of presenting on two of the texts, but I thought it, uh, we didn't have enough time to, for both. So I decided to use only the third one, which I find is more complex. Uh, we did three summary writing. Um, and I have some uh, data for that. But uh, the second one, Into the Volcano and Tracking Tsunami, has some similarity in terms of topics. Uh, they are both popular science on the topic of disaster prevention. And they talk about high science technologies related, related to human society, particularly in terms of preventing, pre predicting, and preventing disasters. And so there is a negotiation of community in addition to negotiation of scientific knowledge only. So, and they, they, they go up, up and down the uh, scale of uh, semantic gravity as well. And the difference was genre and into a volcano was clearly a narrative genre. And so uh, I think I'm going to use this one for another presentation to another uh, audience and as, um, um, this is a chance for me to ask you questions. I'm going to uh, use tracking tsunami. And this has got four divided sections, which stands uh, all, all the way stand alone. So um, it starts, um, sorry, just uh, for you to have a snapshot. The, the text is in uh, three pages, maybe too small to read through, but um, as you can see, there are four sections with section, uh, section titles. The first one, Minami Sanriku talks about uh, an episode in one uh, fishing town in Japan, uh, which was devastated by uh, 311 uh, and tsunami in 2011. After that, uh, the section title said, what is tsunami? So it talks about um, knowledge. Uh, and then uh, the two last se sections uh, talk about one, tsunami predictions, and it talks about uh, some of the tsunami predictions devices put on seafloor. And then uh, the last section, seismologist prediction. It is maybe another story genre uh, or, or an exposition genre. Uh, I, I am still going back and forth and maybe I may not have an answer today and have to really sit with it uh, for uh, some months to come, uh, which I'm very happy to do uh, being, uh, being within nature. But anyway, so that these 
uh, this is the text that uh, I'm going to talk about in, um, in particular. Uh, however, uh, coming back to the concepts here, uh, this is just presenting some of the concepts uh, recontextualized uh, to adjust to my own class. So instead of using uh, uh, ST terms such as semantic gravity and so on, I uh, kind of broke them down into some of the dichotomous notions such as main idea and details and evaluation, uh, event based, knowledge based versus knowledge based, thing focused, uh, human focused, maybe this is not a correct English, I'm not sure, but uh, because uh, there's always uh, going back up and forth between scientific knowledge about things and how they are related to human life and society and human story. So um, this is the concept I thought. And in the summary feed about time, these concepts are kind of wrapped up uh, in a more general term as generous versus specific. And here are some of the slides I used to teach main idea, detail and evaluation. And also in one of the synchronous class, I ask a question, look at this paragraph, is it knowledge-based and event-based and students answer on chat. But you see this uh, Japanese um, letter says private, which means all the students answered me just sending direct message rather than chatting to the whole class. And this is really Japanese because they don't want to make mistakes in public. So they secretly send me, oh, this is event based, oh, this is knowledge based, uh, I'm not sure, etc. And actually this is paragraph three, but um, I had paragraph one and one or two students answered in public, but then they turn into private answers. So it's a little bit unfortunate. But anyway, so here is another uh, set of um, uh, slides I, I used. So um, showing this uh, paragraph slide, it is part of human focus, think focus, and then uh, look at this, disaster, earth crust, et cetera, so think focus. And then the next paragraph. Uh, you you sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah uh, you please, go for it. Yes. Hi, sorry. Um, thanks so much. I'm really interested in this because uh, for, for many years, I was a geography lecturer, and one of the... Um, things that I used to lecture on was disasters and um, hazards and the management of that. And so uh, you coming Lee, from a Hang on a second. We've got a Maristio, can you mute that please? Thank you. Sorry, Lee, the last couple of sentences weren't heard because they were just overridden uh, okay. by some noise. So yeah. I used to I used to do the same sort of content, but in a geography course mm -hmm. and an earth science course. It wasn't so much a language course, but it always interested me how and um, how geography, um, you know, looked at concepts and then case studies and then how that then informed, you know, general principles of understanding the dynamics of tsunamis, um, how they manage, how you mitigate against them and those sort of things. Um, and so one of the things that drew me to LCT was very much this kind of, um, it gave me a way of thinking about the zooming, you know, from, from concepts to case studies back again and so on and through the, the weakening and the strengthening of semantic gravity. Um, so you've got a lot of focus here on, you know, human focused, thing focused and so on. Um, and, and I'm really interested to, see, to hear, you know, if you if, if semantic gravity was, for example, a, a useful comment, uh, a concept in in making sense of these these paragraphs um, and, and, and these texts on tsunamis. It was definitely useful from a geographical point of view, but I was wondering from you from a, um, you know, trying to teach the language, uh, whether that was also something um, that, that, that was useful. Yeah, thank you very much for your question. Yes, uh, I think, uh, I, uh, yeah, you, um, it's useful. Uh, 
And uh, when uh, we talk about language, uh, teaching language uh, here, in this case, English, um, take that, um, particularly this is useful for my situation in this university because the students have already got uh, relatively high uh, skills in English, particularly in reading. And some of the entrance examination reading stuff got a lot of vocabulary and the difficult so-called difficult content into academic uh, and uh, uh, social issues and so on. Uh, so they think that they know the vocabulary, they know the grammar, so they, they are ready to read difficult things and they are motivated towards um, tackling onto these things. And however, if, without uh, the concepts of uh, semantic gravity, they don't know how to handle, for example, uh, this paragraph that is talking about uh, Maya Jin Sato and Miki Endo, women working in the um, center, and how disaster occurred and so on. So this is from geography. So in brief sense, uh, science, because I cannot break down uh, into small details of what uh, subdomains of science, etc. Uh, for me, it's just science <laughs> and SciTech. Uh, but um, this uh, information from science and this in National Geographic textbooks, it's always some interaction between human life and society and human emotion, value, community, etc., and scientific knowledge. And particularly in this case, as uh, it moves on, this is um, the first few paragraphs which talks about uh, the, the episode uh, in a local area. So it's more to do with humans, but then it really springs up in the uh, semantic gravity ladder uh, towards very weak semantic gravity talking about the what is tsunami and how uh, powerful it is and what are the devising uh, so the uh, detecting tsunami detection uh, devices how they are implemented how but then it always talks about it saved some people, but it wasn't able to save uh, some others. And then uh, there's another group of uh, study, which is paleo seismologists um, who studies the history of the land. And then they give the warning and some people uh, receive that warning and um, try to escape, but uh, there's also human nature and there's a, kind of um, concepts of values, negotiation values here. So they are all intertwined in this text, which makes this text uh, difficult, look difficult. So satisfying in the sense that uh, they are challenging enough for my students in this class. And uh, semantic gravity is a way to really um, unpack those intertwined uh, different aspects of uh, uh, strong semantic gravity and weak uh, general concepts and scientific knowledge and so on. And this, uh, I think this is uh, going to be useful and students think uh, it is challenging, but uh, they learn how to do that. So uh, in the summary revision, uh, I think uh, I will be able to show a little bit of that aspect uh, as I go. So, so, okay, thank you. Sorry for the long answer. No, but, no, that's that's. I'm interested to see that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your question. So let me uh, move on. So this is part of the episode. And then uh, in the summary writing uh, part, uh, sorry for some uh, Japanese where I was included here. So this is again the slide, uh, one of the slides I shared, uh, summary right, uh, points in summary writing. So please make the balance between knowledge-based in information and event-based information so that uh, all the readers of, uh, of uh, Tracking Tsunami are very familiar with the episode of Mickey Endo and so on, uh, but they don't, they should not 
focus only on that. Uh, this uh, text is also talking about uh, scientific knowledge. So go up uh, the semantic wave and uh, look at uh, knowledge based information and make a balance and uh, distinguish between general and specific. And also, uh, some of the tips such as information in the first part, few part tend to be known, so trim it off, avoid repetition. This is from uh, Japanese grammar. Uh, since Japanese uh, doesn't have the same uh, grammatical category uh, of pronouns uh, as in English and other languages, we tend to repeat nouns. So this is one tip that I had from grammar perspective. But then, so uh, after the class is over, I asked uh, for students' uh, consent to use their data. And fortunately, I had th these people, uh, which are not all the students, but uh, one fourth, one third of students uh, agreed to use their data. And uh, so then I tried to kind of uh, draft up a translation device uh, that can be applied to both. And as I tried to uh, write them up, uh, the thing I wanted to kind of make contrast in was, as uh, they asked me and uh, I said, uh, the the grading between the scientific knowledge that applies uh, everywhere, anytime, and personal uh, aspect of the experience of the specific event. And in between, uh, so uh, from uh, above, uh, weaker semantic gravity, uh, general. Uh, description, interpretation of uh, phenomenon, also definition of devices, of definition of uh, scientific concepts and so on, that's the highest. And secondly, technological evaluative aspect of possible phenomenon, uh, particularly in relation to human society. So when I pick up some words such as dangerous, uh, if the tsunami is happening where nobody's there, it's not dangerous. The tsunami is dangerous because that can affect uh, human life. So uh, that means uh, it's a low, lower uh, in, on the layer uh, in terms of semantic gravity. And then um, at zero point, I thought factual information about specific event and phenomenon, and also general information about some uh, professional activities, such as many uh, seismologists uh, sent out uh, tsunami warning, warning to all over Japan. It's, it was sent to many places, so that's general information. However, uh, some specific uh, professional activities, uh, such as uh, paleo seismologists, uh, Z and colleagues had discovered uh, that th there will be another tsunami uh, possibility near Sumatra, uh, etc. And then personal experience for specific event, uh, such as uh, Mayor Sato survived by holding onto the radio antenna. And uh, so discovery worried Z so much. Yeah. The, the subject is discovery, so uh, I am still struggling whether to uh, put that up or uh, down below. But um, my understanding is uh, the layer between thing and closer to personal experience of the specific event. So this is how I created my talking tsunami semantic wave, and I need I still need to work a little bit. Uh, but uh, this is it. And also, um, you see that there is a flow here. And that is because there, on each section, there is a section title. And I decided that section title uh, can serve as a flow. Uh, because otherwise, Minami Sandik episode uh, finished like uh, um, Mickey Endo may have saved thousands of lives. Then tsunami occurs sometimes everywhere in the world. So it goes up, uh, then uh, there's no flow, but uh, since, oh, sorry, uh, there is this section title, I made it as a wave, as a flow. 
Then here is a set of student summary, uh, which is interesting because in the first version, he just made the bullet point uh, of each section and he wrote uh, what he thought as important in each section. Whereas uh, in the revised version, he um, maybe from grammatical point of view need to, and factual point of view again, you need to just make some correction uh, because um, many world countries uh, decided to uh, work on countermeasure and develop tsunami. That happened uh, before uh, 2011, but uh, he is now trying to create his uh, own uh, flow here which I thought was interesting. So the, uh, the waves that I created here, uh, the first version, there's no flow. So just episode, then knowledge, then uh, tsunami, and what many countries did. And then um, another paleo seismologist uh, getting aware of the uh, tsunami's problem and did something. But uh, in the second one, he created a flow and he, in some of the comments, he wrote uh, the English terms uh, like summary, event-based, general, specific, and he needed to add some scientific knowledge such as tsunami, seismometers, and he needed to add some of the uh, definition of concepts, why they are uh, established on the seafloor, and added some terms and tried to be uh, more general. So, are you mean? Sorry to interrupt. Yes. Uh, yes, sir, please. she asked a question in the chat, Rita. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, Rita has her hand up. Oh, there's a hand up? Yeah. Uh, question on, in the chat that I think may be relevant to what you're talking about right now. Uh, Rita, can you ask your question? Please, please go ahead. Yes, yes. Uh, always jump in for questions. Yes. So uh, is there a question? Uh, hire me. Did you think of using? Uh, yeah, density, density condensation. Thank you very much for your suggestion. I will try to do. I am now just using SG because this is the first concept to use, but uh, I might want to use density as well because really uh, packing up events and uh, I thought that would be useful. Yeah. You mean? It was the next That's question. That's not Rita's that question. The next question. Yeah. Rita, do you, you want to actually ask graded? it? Yeah. Rita, do you want to actually ask your question? Yeah, thank you very Go much for, for the next question. Uh, student summaries, uh, um, during the course time, uh, it's sort of for formative uh, evaluation. So I didn't mark these uh, revision, but at the end of the semester, uh, there were two, three more texts that we read. So I assigned uh, students to choose one of them and to create a better summaries uh, using these concepts. So that those ones were marked. I, I just used these, uh, sorry, uh, these, um, first and second version of their summaries uh, as part of their learning process. Yeah. And uh, any other thing? No, no, thank you very much for your question. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I see. Yeah, so does that answer your question, Rita? Hope, hope it did. Yeah. And any other? Um, yes, thing? hello. Hello, are you yes. me? Uh, Hello. Uh, hi, uh, this is Nashua. Um, yes. I was thinking about uh, when we ask students to summarize in general, right? What we're hoping that they would do is pull gist from different parts of the text, like what is really important there to summarize. Uh -huh. And and for this, I see that, and and I'm not sure. I mean, others can jump in and and say also what they think. Um, is that it's important uh, that they would sequence things. And, and I'm thinking that maybe the disconnect that you see in the first um, uh, way, oh, in the first graph that you have is that there was no sequencing uh -huh. um, yes. um, and, and that maybe in the second there is, and, and therefore it's not enough to look at just 
um, the how they unpack meaning, how they use the terms, and then how they unpack them. So mm -hmm. it's also important to look at how they sequence, um, yes. because this is what uh, I mean. Just to look at what summaries are for in general. So it's not just using LCT per se, but helping the students um, like reach the purpose of what a summary is for, whatever mm -hmm. that, you know, whatever you decide that means. Mm -hmm. um, so it, in, in, in that sense, this is what, I, it's just a comment. Um, mm -hmm. and I think it's very interesting. And um, one of the things that I wouldn't know how to deal with here, and maybe others can answer, is to what extent is patch writing for example, in this case, would it be important or not important? Um, like how much do students adopt from the original text? Because if it, if it is supposed to be, um, you know, in their own words, uh, because we want to see how much they can um, create meaning on their own. Otherwise, it's going to be just copy and paste from different parts of the text. Is to what extent then would uh, grammatical errors be important or not important? I mean, for an EFL, ESL teacher. Yeah, um, in my uh, class, uh, at least this is uh, uh, reading oriented rather than writing oriented. So rather than teaching summary writing in a writing course, I think uh, summary writing activity is meant to really uh, pack up uh, specific meaning into uh, ge more general and uh, weaker uh, GSG uh, terms. And also uh, what you made a point in sequencing, it means relating different uh, la layers of knowledge. Uh, that was, um, um, I think, the important part. And in the uh, earlier, um, one of the earlier slide I provided that actually uh, in um, in the orientation oh, sorry in one of the slides here general objective was to create your own reading navigation system so this is the one of the concepts that I use. At, LCT uh, semantic gravity for uh, breaking down into these terms. And so uh, when you want to navigate, then if the knowledge goes up, ups and downs, just like this from uh, very concrete uh, human experience to uh, high up in the scientific knowledge and goes up and down, and then it's very hard to navigate. And, uh, but, and also to relate how this uh, knowledge is related to human activity or human emotion and so on. So uh, I do agree um, that sequencing is important. And I think maybe in one of the slides, I encourage students to relate the content um, um, in addition to understanding um, understanding whether particular content is um, strong in semantic gravity or weaker, but uh, to relate how these uh, different kind of knowledge is related. So that's what I, I think part of what I taught, which should probably be the reason why the students uh, did it in his own way. Uh, although uh, when they, uh, uh, he, he used the term and maybe in grammatically there are a lot of uh, correction uh, there to make and to improve. Uh, but, and also, uh, many students copied one bit part of many and uh, that's another issue and but uh, I think uh, by encouraging them to relate them uh, they needed to really use their own terms in addition to just uh, copy and paste uh, what they thought that they were very important uh, what they thought was important so uh, generalization uh, from these findings so far is that uh, uh, the first version tended to focus on the first few paragraphs and the details of the significant event retailed from their memory. However, through intervention, they are more able to pack up details and generalize towards uh, 
week uh, ST. Uh, the second, uh, the first version paid less attention to scientific knowledge because they are non-science students and rarely defined scientific terms. Uh, however, they became aware of these aspects and better able to uh, relate scientific knowledge with events and to see a uh, relationship between those events. So this is uh, some of the findings. Yeah, and yes, across genres and disciplinary areas, thank you very much for your comments because uh, there are a number of things I want to explore from here, building on this and using these materials from popular science, from National Geographic Science. There's always a certain a negotiation the community in addition to scientific knowledge. So maybe this is too much. And I, I should go step by step. And I already received uh, some um, feedback uh, regarding using semantic density, which is great. But uh, I want to incorporate the aspect of uh, community negotiation, negotiation of value here. So for one thing, I have to figure out what the overall genre of tracking tsunami is, but uh, I'm wondering if there's a place for autonomy uh, or axiology to be useful uh, in the exploration. Yeah, really, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, I uh, thank you for your advice. Ayumi, I, I'm just gonna, I, Ayumi, I'm just gonna point to you that it's uh, three minutes to five, so you might just wanna yes. be, keep an eye on the time. Thank you very much. Yes, so thank you very much. Uh, it's, I think it's time to, for me to finish. So, sorry, again, I tried to be short, but um, still uh, a little bit delayed. <laughs> sorry, Thomas. And uh, I okay. hand over to Thomas. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. Uh, let me get my uh, slides up myself. One moment, please. that yeah, sorry can everyone clear. see that okay awesome yeah that's thank clear you. we can see that thanks to you we won't like we won't you know we'll wait until the end to thank everybody but yeah okay okay that's uh, very clear all right. Thanks. Well, uh, again, thank you very much, Ayumi, for uh, that very interesting uh, talk and for introducing LCT Japan. Uh, I appreciate Carl saying, you know, if you want a group, if you want to join a group, um, you all you need are two members. That is actually literally LCT Japan, me and Ayumi, pretty much. Um, there are other people who are affiliated with us, Dominic Hensel, for example, who can't come here, who couldn't be here today. The other people in our um, uh, Facebook group, but it's basically just me and Ayumi. So that's all it takes. All right. And you can have your very own round table. So if you're a little uh, unsure or unconfident, don't worry, or join other, uh, uh, we will be partnering with uh, LCT Singapore at the uh, uh, LC 3.5 in January. So anyway, uh, without further ado, let me get started. Um, in my talk today, uh, just looking at uh, uh, Japanese secondary EFL classes with semantic gravity and autonomy. Oh, I'm sorry, Thomas Amanrud. That's my name. By the way, the family name is Amanrud. I mean, you got my name wrong. It's Amanrud. Okay. Sorry. No one else. Oh, right. I, I've heard it's uh, it's actually more correct in Katakana. But anyway, um, so as Ayumi said, uh, my work uh, here is mainly looking at uh, secondary school classrooms. I do use LCT uh, kind of under the teaching at universities, but I'm not researching with it. And that's what I'm coming at it with. So uh, in this talk, and I'll try to keep it short because I know uh, we've only got until uh, uh, 5.30. So um, introduce my study overall, give some background on English education in Japan, which kind of uh, uh, tags on to what Taiyumi has already said, tell you about my data, and then uh, give you some questions, some of the uh, um, first, I'll be talking about semantic gravity. I've actually done some work already published. Uh, I shouldn't say published. I've uh, submitted a paper, which will hopefully be published and presented some uh, using semantic gravity and gesture uh, to look at gotten. And then also uh, the work that I will be doing uh, on uh, autonomy. And uh, by the way, you can see the deer in the background. There are also children beasts in my house who uh, may or may not interrupt. Don't. Um, and um, autonomy and language choice in EFL teaching. And uh, these are some questions that I hope to get some feedback from you all about uh, in our session today.
So my overall study, though, is um, looking at uh, secondary school EFL classroom data. This is part of a larger examination of multimodal pedagogy. Uh, I believe it's the first SPS Kakiani grant that uses LCT, I think, or one of the few anyway, uh, certainly one of the few with uh, SFMDA. Uh, this is really much a very much a work in progress, as Ayumi said. And well, I'm working through existing systems and frameworks. I'm asking some questions, and I really would appreciate your uh, comments, uh, both here or later on. So, okay. So, background. Um, English education in Japan, it's part of the curriculum here. Excuse me one moment. I'm being. Okay, sorry about that. But the perils of working from home, being asked from by by some snacks. And the answer is no. <laughs> but anyway, because <laughs> anyway, stop bothering me. That's not you. That's her. Um, anyway, a foreign language education. It's with English. Uh, it starts from uh, fifth year of elementary school. Uh, actually, Gaikoku Katsudo uh, foreign language uh, activities start from the third year, but that in theory, it's supposed to include other languages. Basically, uh, by the end of schooling, uh, students, by the finish times they finish high school, they're supposed to have eight years of English education with the changes from this year, from last year, I'm sorry, for 2020, uh, that becomes 10 years. And if you add on at university, at universities have a year or two of foreign languages, which is usually English, you can have up towards two, 10 to 12 years of uh, English education for people who graduate university. And, more than 50% of the uh, Japan does attend university. So, however, Japan's rankings globally, such as in the EF uh, English Proficiency Index from last year, uh, 58, uh, just a few years before, it was in the mid-30s, mid um, they've been sliding. And this is a, often a cause of consternation in the media, a uh, cause of concern in because uh, the proficiency of English and the ability of the Japanese uh, students and graduates of schools in English, uh, especially relative to other uh, neighbors, neighbor countries in Asia and economic competitors, be in decline, or at least it's not improving as much as they are. So that's the context in which uh, my study is uh, placed. So what do the students learn in their class? Now, ostensibly the Ministry of Education, or Ministry of Education, Sports, Technology, science and technology, I think is the title, I forget. Mombo uh, show, but they abbreviate as, as MEXT. So when you see MEXT, that's what it means. It's the Ministry of Education. Um, they stipulate that uh, all classes are supposed to be communicative classes using CLT. So the goal is the students can um, express themselves. They can uh, engage in certain uh, 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 on social situations, uh, they can, uh, have, although the word genre is not used in the curriculum, to my knowledge, they can use a, a limited range of, of um, written and spoken genres in uh, English. That's the idea. And in principle, all the high school classes uh, from 2018 were supposed to be taught in uh, English, and classes from 2020 were supposed to be taught in English. And uh, you can see this on MEXT's policy documents. Uh, there's no date on this, but I believe this was from 2014, because the idea was that they would have all of this ready for the Olympics. Um, so you can see on the second half, on the uh, right side, lower secondary school, uh, try to be able to understand and carry out some simple information exchanges, classes conducted in English, upper secondary news upper secondary school, I apologize, uh, against conducted in English and trying to do things like presentations and debates and negotiations. That's what's on paper. That's what the Ministry of Education says they're trying to do. So with that in mind, uh, I wanted to uh, get some data and look at so two classes. Um, so two classes I looked at was one as a, um, a private secondary, uh, I'm sorry, pr private uh, high school. Uh, second year class at a private high school. Um, 
observed four lessons. Uh, now this high school is kind of at the lower end of the informal prefectural scale. Um, so this year I looked at uh, three lessons from a uh, single uh, second uh, year public municipal junior high school class. So I wanted to see, okay, what's, how, what's going on in practice, sorry. Now, what are the textbooks? What's being used in these? Now, in these classes, the textbooks for both of these classes, they consist of compartmentalized it's these topics uh, of social interest, like car sharing at the social in the uh, high school data, like you'll be seeing today, or in the uh, kind of introduction to India, kind of a student's uh, a student from India's self introduction school data, which I'll be using more of in uh, January at LCD 3.5. And uh, the thing is, according to my informal survey of recent junior high school and high school textbooks, basically, I got six of each university library. It's a university of education. So they have the, all the textbooks there, matching set uh, from each, tried to look informally at what genres were in those books. There was no consistent patterns of genre development and an explicit cumulative and emphasis on cumulative uh, development of grammatical structures. And that's consistent with prior research, such as into inconsistent textbook coverage across publishers. In, in Japan, you have publishers who publish textbooks that are approved of by the Ministry of Education, uh, or there's a haphazard introduction of, of common syntactic forms like WH interrogatives. So there seems to be an issue the construction of the materials here. So the question is, well, what is going on in these classes? Okay, because there's quite a bit of work going on. And what's going on is what's called, and which I mentioned was called the Juken Ego, uh, examination English. So you can see the kanji, so ju, you know, take, can, test. Okay, taking a test. And like this quote says, for lots of Japanese learners in junior high school and high school, the study of English is associated with English examinations. It's emphasizing grammar and vocabulary and reading comprehension. And although this is over 20, oh, nearly 20 years old, uh, that still seems to be the case uh, as evidence in the data that I've collected. No. Now, what are the students doing? A lot of times they're doing what's called yakudoku. That's literally uh, translate and read. And it's characterized often by these uh, extensive IRF sequences where the teacher will, you know, individual phrases or uh, sentences, you know, search for the answer. Okay. IRF sequence or vice versa, uh, Japanese phrase or uh, sentence from the text and do English. And this can take for, you know, for most of the lesson or a written translation exercise. Um, unlike grammar translation, like uh, how it describes, where there's a uh, grammatical form that you're trying to uh, instruct using a particular text that's translated, uh, the goal is to create a syntactically correct Japanese translation, which is the basis for understanding. Now, the thing is, though, although this is a common practice, uh, translation and test preparation are included in the official curriculum which ostensibly promotes a balanced for our skills focus. Okay, so we've got a tension here, all right? Um, and the thing is these textbooks appear to uh, be cated on the assumption that teachers are going to use translation as the primary means for conveying meaning. And so they reflect this contradictory position vis-a-vis uh, -vis ministry guidance and classroom practice. Thing is though, we give too much emphasis on juken ego, on uh, translation as being endemic to Japanese secondary EFL. It can overlook the work that uh, many tea bridgers uh, in high schools and junior high schools in Japan and many educational societies are doing to develop communicative and functional language education, okay? And even though its persistence points to the continued inadequacies, inadequacies in that language ed teacher education, for example, um, in language teacher education programs, a lot of times students may have very few, if any, classes actually teaching how to teach languages. They'll have classes on linguistics, they'll have classes on literature, they will not actually have classes on language. Or how uh, uh, there will be uh, in Japan, and this is not just language teachers, this is uh, across the curriculum, uh, trainee teachers only have two weeks of uh, I'm sorry, the word is escaping me right now. Uh, teacher practicum. Uh, compare that to say six months in many other countries uh, or even. 
Okay, so we've got some tensions here, and it's this tension into which my present study is investigating and perhaps intervening, depending on what happens. So that's the background. Uh, very quickly, overview of uh, other parts of my study, because as Amy said, I'm coming at this from SFL. I got my PhD from uh, Macquarie under John Knox, 2017, right when um, LCT blew up. And I was like, oh my God, I really want to use this stuff, but I cannot include it in my PhD. Here I am. Okay, but so I'm still using lots of uh, LC of lots of SFL uh, in terms of examining pedagogy in terms of exchange or pedagogic register or language shift, which I'll be coming back to in a moment. I'm also doing a lot of SFMDA work, uh, looking at the use of classroom space, uh, the relation of position of the teachers in relation to the students and the meanings that they can make. And by the way, I'm looking mainly at the teachers in these classrooms, not so much at the students. Uh, and then also gesture, which I'm analyzing in terms of representation, which I'll talk about more uh, later on. Okay, but that's the stuff I'm not going to be talking about today. I have talked about it elsewhere. Mainly, I'll be looking at LCT, because that's what we're here for. Now, we all know LCT semantic gravity, which meaning is related to its context. And uh, in uh, a talk in October 1st of last year, Jaeg and Doran, who unfortunately isn't here today, uh, shared this uh, translation device, which I have uh, copied and used and cited uh, wholesale. And I do feel kind of a little bit strange because he has not actually published this yet. And I've been in uh, private conversation. We're actually, actually, Thomas, that's Yakin and me and we, uh, it's it's my fault because, uh, well, he, he's, he took a long time to do a draft, another draft, and I've got another, it's my turn. So it's still in the drafting, but the actual the actual categories will stay the same. So okay, and this and I cited because I cited this from his um, talk last year. No, that's no, that's Darren and Mayton, and it'll come out as soon as we have enough space and in our calendar to to okay, catch up with them so much. Very much. Thank you very much. And I'll contact for, you. It's also for epistemic semantic gravity. Just so you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not axiological. Mm -hmm. yeah it's one of okay. those things that's I'm in just a making... massive backlog at the moment a massive okay. backlog of work that thank you very much do. i'm going to email you uh just to, to make sure that i have it right you know in case it gets uh published and it, as i present this elsewhere so thank you very much i'll be in touch with you carl um but anyway um you can tell me it correctly and you applying it correctly, I would appreciate that. Um, so in this, <laughs> if I can remember, <laughs> okay, well, regardless, um, so as you can see, uh, in uh, epistemic semantic gravity, we got uh, two subtypes, four subtypes, um, the two subtypes symbolic and manifest. Oh, yes. Uh, so symbolics, they display the stability of meaning in their position in specialized symbolic domains, the subtypes conceptual, which um, can't be physically present and are therefore distant from the material context, so very weak uh, semantic gravity, uh, and then uh, material, where uh, they can potentially be physically present and thus are less distant, okay, but still uh, stable because of their uh, specialized symbolic domain. Whereas then you've got the manifest where the meaning is at the location, but by uh, the context, and I would say, I would say, at least in my data, also a co-text as well. Um, and for that, you have intangibles, where uh, material context and it's not physically perceptible. That's not an issue with my data, I don't think. Uh, but I do have some manifest tangibles, where there is a potential for physical presence. So. Correct to me, Carl. Uh, so here, this is my uh, transcript. This is just an excerpt from the data that I uh, looked at from one uh, section from a uh, class talking about car sharing. Um, the, in these 15 uh, moves, 15 lines, uh, the teacher Kenta, K, um, is uh, trying to trying share knowledge base for what uh will happen if you know what what is um how do we reduce co2 through car sharing 
Okay, so the students jump straight to the answer. Okay, so well, what's uh, the number of so if we start car sharing? Oh, CO2. Okay, well, before that, what happens before that? Um, okay, the answer is elsewhere. By the way, I'm reading the, the uh, English translation, but uh, Ayumi and people who speak Japanese, you can see the Japanese original there as well. Okay, um, do you have to share something? Something has to decrease first cars. Okay, so he's rejecting qualified rejection and then getting the students to answer. Excellent. Okay, and the number of cars has to decrease and then line 10. If the number of car decreases, the amount of what is going to decrease? Okay. All of these, these are mainly symbolic materials. Okay, these are the dominant subtype of semantic gravity uh, comprising nine out of the 10 out of the moves. And the idea is that while well, the register field of, is, of these utterances concerns car sharing and associated topics of the consumption of natural resources and therefore of atmospheric CO2. Okay, these topics are stable because they have a, a shared conceptual domain, but they are potentially physically perceptible. All right, that's why I get that. I did find one uh, least of the least context dependent subtypes that was symbolic conceptuals, where the, uh, Kenta says the answer is elsewhere. Okay, so he's rejecting the student's answer. Answer it belongs to a separate symbolic domain. Okay, that's got no uh, connection to a, any. Up and any um, anything that's potentially physically perceivable. There were fewer entrances, and these were confined to the student displays. Uh, I didn't find any manifest intangibles. I did find what I analyzed as four manifest intangibles of uh, the student uh, displays of CO2 or of cars uh, or of gas that these are tangible because they obtain their meaning from the physical context and maybe also from the co-text as displays. Okay, in response to the teacher's prompts. So, gravity in terms of just what's going on uh, in language. Uh, then I also got the idea from Bacon uh, Doran's presentation last year uh, about determinate physicals. Uh, and um, so, yeah, these utterances by Kent of the teacher was fairly low, and the teacher's expanding, expounding, excuse me, on both languages, fairly abstract symbolic concepts. And remember, like I said earlier, this school was not the highest level school in the. Uh, but these concepts like car sharing and CO2, these are grounded in the context of students' uh, potential physical experience. And so I coded them as symbolic materials. Nevertheless, it's kind of abstract. So slow semantic gravity uh, was uh, modulated is through determinate physicals. Uh, where uh, the teacher uh, was able to give a greater semantic gravity, gra gravity to the utterances through gesture. And this gets back into my analysis of uh, gesture. I'll take you, I'll let you take a look at that one moment. Okay, uh, in the system of representing action, uh, I hypothesize uh, 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 gestures both uh, corresponded to an independent of language can be hypothesized as actions, uh, activities akin to processes, verbs, uh, items akin to participant, or qualities akin to circumstance, circumstances, uh, adjectives and adverbs. And these describe what a kindred's continuum are called metaphorics or icons or emblems, but we have a clearer relation to language. And of course, we're also using dead well. So let me just show you what I mean. Um, so here's one example where he says it's before that. Okay. One example, or here, okay, where the onset of uh, Daisuga Hereba. Nanika heru. Okay. If the number of cars decreases, what else decreases? That gesture or here, the deactic in line 14 that uh, on the onset of decrease that uh, turns in a uh, representing activity. Um, these are all examples of the teacher using gestures to uh, strengthen the semantic gravity uh, and uh, make the concepts less abstract. Now, of course, it's a down escalator. Okay, there's no uptake by the students shown uh, in this classroom data. So that is an issue to consider. Another way that modulation occurred was 
change. So we have uh, the DK1 moves in line 14 uh, that decreases semantic gravity uh, with the um, uh, uh, increased semantic gravity of the two fonts in line nine. Same thing happens in line 13, lines 13 and 15. So there's basically what I call a mutual modulation of semantic gravity in response to student uptake. Okay, so that where the teacher is rejecting with qualification and the proposed student answers, that helps to keep the uh, semantic gravity from getting too high, getting too low, excuse me. So uh, basically, summary of, for uh, semantic gravity is the two means through which this teacher and the students, they modulate the relatively low semantic gravity through the, these utterances is both through these determined physical gestures and through the uh, Mutual modulation, primary neural exchanges. Okay, so that's the kind of that's the work that I've presented mainly about, uh, and that's uh, I'm still working on this. I'm still analyzing more uh, data for this, but that's what's been more developed. Uh, where I'm moving uh, more, and where I'll be presenting more in uh, the LC 3.5 in January, is about autonomy, and I'm using I see. Uh, uh, Ken Tan is right there. Awesome. Okay. Uh, I'm. Thank you very much for uh, your paper uh, in 2020. Um, I like your uh, definition of positional autonomy about uh, concerning the strength of relations between elements of a context and those without a, from outside a context. Um, for my study, for Kenta's work, because this is kind of an EAP light class, um, hypothesized that the P uh, positional autonomy core is the EAP like content. And while the focus on language elements is ancillary, uh, that's opposite of what you have in your paper. I'm, I, I'm not entirely certain which one's going to be better, um, whether it's better to put the language focus as core and the uh, content as ancillary. I'm not quite sure which is going to be better. But for now, I've, I, this is what I'm working with. Um, and the target. Uh, of teaching English in English, uh, and the non-target is uh, teaching using uh, L1 Japanese, and that's based upon the next uh, guidance earlier. Okay, relational economy, that's the content of the lesson. So uh, the core is focused on the core curricular content of, in this case, car sharing. Uh, ancillary is focusing on the, you know, teaching the grammar and vocabulary. Um, and non-target is things like discipline and housekeeping. So we can see how it works. Um, by the way, in my um, translation device, I had these designates. I wouldn't actually publish that, but I'm just showing that to you because I was it enabled me to uh, make this um, uh, plain uh, this profile uh, through uh, Excel automatically. Um, so makes things a little bit easier, uh, but it's not really publishable. Uh, so I uh, smoothened it with the uh, planes that uh, uh, from Matten Matten Howard 2018 from the LCT website. And you, uh, we've got uh, round trips mainly between the sovereign and interjected code, and that you is uh, mainly seen in the excerpt here. Okay, so we have lots of use of uh, bringing knowledge. Uh, and bring the students into the sovereign code, which is uh, the teaching of English in English. So uh, that's from this data that I've looked at, Kanta, uh, from my high school teacher. And uh, I'm showing mainly in that and also another analysis I've done that uh, there's primarily sovereign and introductory codes. I'm still finding this. I'm not entirely certain if my definition of ancillary versus core is distinct or whether or not the uh, PA and uh, core and ancillary should be reversed, if I understand uh, uh, Kenton and League's paper correctly. I'm not quite sure of that. And I'm also wondering, OK, when I use uh, on curricular topic as a part of the description of positional autonomy, does that overlap with relational autonomy, and is that a problem? OK. I know with uh, realization statements in SFL, you can't have overlapping realization statements. I'm wondering, in uh, LCT uh, descriptions, is that an issue as well that I should be This is question intonation for a reason, because I'm not sure. That sounded like an interesting question, except my, uh, my, um, my 
headphones are just knocking about. So can you just say that again? Okay, is it an issue if you have overlapping descriptions between the PA and the RA? So, for example, my position in my positional autonomy, uh, one of the issues uh, um, is if something is is on curricular topic, and I'm wondering is that overlapping with the RA, and is that an issue? Is that a problem? Because, in, like for example, in realization statements in SFL, you can't have overlapping realization statement. Each uh, option in a system well, has to be unique. Well, no, system now is very, very different. But what in LCT is that every organizing principle underlies everything. So the, the same empirical data might, um, it's very likely that the same empirical data will be um, an example of something in um, a strength of semantic gravity, a strength of semantic density, a strength of epistemic relations, a strength of temporal orientation, and everything else. So it's um, it's likely, I'm sorry, I'm fighting with my uh, sound at the moment. It, it, it's likely that the same data can be analyzed using different, uh, you don't allocate data to a principle. Um, data is never in one principle. It's underlying, you know, it's, it's empirical data is, under, there's the underlying organizing principles and all of them sit under all data. And it's just which ones we're focusing on. So when you come to the description of a category of a strength, stronger semantic gravity, context dependence, stronger semantic or weaker semantic density, complexity, for example, those two things might have the same sentence being able to be illustrated or the same, whatever you've put down, the same movement, whatever it is, the piece of empirical data may have attributes. They may be the same words. They may have attributes that indicate a strength of semantic gravity and attributes that's indicate a strength of semantic density. Um, and even the same words can do that. It's a case of, um, um, I always say that uh, the organizing principles of LCT are a bit like um, uh, seeing the same person in through an X-ray and then through a gamma ray camera and then through a CAT scan and then through a, um, uh, another form of, um, sort of, you know, uh, medical vision that sees different aspects of the same body. So you never allocate empirical to, uh, you know, you wouldn't say that um, this thing here is semantic gravity. This thing here is characterized by stronger semantic gravity. It could also be characterized by weaker semantic density. It could be characterized by, categorized by um, positional autonomy and relative relational autonomy as well. But so it's just a case of the definition. You have to get the definitions right in your study as to what is a constituent in terms of uh, autonomy, what's a constituent and what's a way of arranging a, constitu a set of constituents for this one. Weirdly, I feel like not talking to my headphones makes me feel a bit strange, but did that make sense? Or does anybody else want to ask something about that? I'll be honest with you. Sorry. I'm back. Yes. <laughs> Carry on. Was there anyone that I, I'm? I, I'll be perfectly honest, uh, Carl. I think I'm going to have to uh, listen to the recording and uh, digest what you said, and then probably ask you some questions about it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I said. Yeah. I mean, a system network allocates things to various. Yeah. It, uh, principles don't. Uh, the strength of a principle. Uh, is a characterization of an attribute of uh, the empirical data. So you never allocate stuff to, to a strength in the sense of like that's just there and, and not also underpinned by other. Um, but I'm probably not explaining this very well because I'm very tired today. That's all right. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll questions if that's okay. Mm. Yeah, okay. I mean, if you can ask a question like that on the forum, that would be awesome because I'm sure there's a lot of people that would. Um, be interested in in okay in that. okay um, okay well but, uh, but i don't i do the, i don't want to do that out of the blue but perhaps we can dialogue this through email and then um turn this into a, a question in public later um but anyway i did have a not quite done yet so i apologize i know it's uh, already uh, 30 past but uh, there is a little bit more to go um because uh, early in the talk, I talked about this tension between community, community 
learning methods, which are officially endorsed by the Ministry of Education, and the Juken Ego Teaching Methods, which remain prevalent in Japanese uh, secondary EFL classes. And my next study with this data is going to be investigating further uh, from data where the primary language of instruction was Japanese. Um, even when the teacher acknowledged in interviews that she recognized the validity and the use of uh, communicative like, teaching approaches and whose English was quite good herself. So um, looking at this teacher's data, this uh, I hope to be presenting more in uh, January. I'm kind of wondering, okay, uh, if I have my PA, my positional autonomy in terms of teaching English and English is, if I analyze this teacher's data, then it's all going to be not in the sovereign code, it's all going to be uh, interjected, at least. Okay. Me, a little bit exotic too, but never, almost never sovereign. Okay. And I'm wondering, does that indicate, you know, if we're doing this in kind of a grounded theory manner, um, that uh, I need to change my coding? Um, and I'm wondering, and I, I, I'm, I'm just only throwing this term out there, this, this idea of a counter sovereign, kind of like an anti pope, um, came to mind that the L1 using Ju the Jukinego using examination English is actually the norm. That is actually the target. Um, uh, and also, what are some other structural or what are the, the structural that contribute to that, like, for example, teacher overwork, like uh, uh, secondary school teachers, according to OECD, uh, in Japan teach far more uh, than uh, at work far more hours than other uh, uh, teachers around the world. They do 54 hours a week on average, um, or inadequate teacher training, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, can these or should these be factored into the, determining the target? Again, I, I'm curious. I mean, we've got the policy docs uh, and the red, you know, English should be taught in English. But is that sufficient for determining what the target is? I'm not sure who you asked question. Thomas, this is such a big question that we've run out of time to discuss. Um, but um, okay. Well, that, then I'll leave it as I'll, be, I'll, leave, I'll leave it as a rhetorical question. And that's an empirical question, question, depending upon the specific objective study. Okay. okay. But there can be more than one target, and there can be competing targets. Okay, that's the, that is an answer I needed to know. Thank you. All right, awesome. And then last last thing I got is close is a little coda closing thoughts and moving beyond constructivism. I I have not been critical of the constructivist pedagogies embodied in CLT and the commutative language teaching. Um, those of you all who have training in pedagogies and genre of studied SFL teaching. I worked with Jim uh, uh, Martin and David Rose and others in that school. Um, this has probably been bugging you. It was always in the back of my mind as I was doing this work. And I didn't talk about that intentionally because I see this as kind of a dialectical tension between that and the instructivist Juken Ego tradition. And so if people in Japan, if we want to get beyond this teacher-centered uh, student-centered pendulum, David Rose and Tim Martin call it, where you have to analyze our situation clearly, like what I'm trying to do here. But uh, that's not enough. For that, we need to build curriculum, and that requires allies, and that gets into the localization, which Ayumi started our talk, started our session on. So uh, I'm going to skip past my references, but there's my email. If anyone wants to screen that, screenshot that, I'd be happy to take questions because we do have some topics for discussion. I know we're out of time, but usually our talks can go up to 45-ish, Carl. So by that token, we would still have another 10 minutes. Can we have another Right 10? now? Are we yeah. Right now? No, well, we're, really, we're really pushing time now because people are um, uh, uh, leaving, so. Oh, um, too bad. So you might wanna, um, are you able to um, sort of, Summarize. Well, no, these were these were the questions that we had because um, Ayumi and I, when we were preparing for today, uh, we thought of these questions as part of that we at LCT Japan are uh, dealing with, and that we would like to get some insights from our colleagues around the world as to how you might be dealing with similar topics or you might have dealt with similar topics. And uh, these are know, these are really great. I tell you what, I think this would be because we're a bitch. Um, because we're over time. I think what this would be okay. brilliant as is to 
this is really good um, stuff that I think would be really great. Um, and Lee maybe can um, comment on this as well to, to bring up on the forum as things that we can sort of start to engage with as a community. So rather than just the, the people who are here um, right this minute, it would be great to bring these things up because they are issues you know, that I'm sure are relevant to people in all sorts of contexts, you know. Um, problem three is something that I've had for the last 21 years. So it's something that's really, you know, um, not new and have loads of ways of dealing with that. Um, number two is, you know, uh, something that we have all dealt with in terms of, um, um, there's so much that can be done without getting major grants. There's so much that can be done without large scale research. Um, you know, and, uh, and number one is a, is, a, is a really interesting issue to do with how to persuade in rhetorical moves and how to be engaging with, and one and three, engaging with people who are invested in other approaches and how to engage with them in a really constructive and productive way so that it doesn't seem like there's an enormous cognitive load that you're asking them, or in fact, actually, that you're asking them to divest from their deep investment already in some approach and you know, um, trying to sort of you know, convert them or something. So there, these are really interesting. I think these are great topics that we should actually engage with, you know, more widely on um, the forum. And I, you know, if we put them up there, maybe um, it's something that. What do you think, Lee? It's the sort of thing that I know that we could all um, contribute to. Yeah, I think that that would be really, really helpful. And I think that we all invested in this and there's a lot of um, common, you know, concern around these challenges. So I think that that would be very useful. Thank you. Okay, well, that's great. I'm glad we're able to get something out of that. Sorry, we weren't able to use it in the same way, but maybe this is even better. Like no, I said. think this is, I think this is even better to do it in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so how shall we go about doing that? Oh, well, just, you know, say these are questions that came up um, and we, we, we've been discussing about LCT Japan and, um, okay, so know, just, and what if you yeah, so just, just put it just, out there. Just, okay, we can do that. I'll engage, Maybe that's okay Lee will you. engage other people in other places, you know, like, um, uh, uh, you know, like we're, all of us are working in other fields apart from LCT, you know, either SFL or all our topic fields as well. And these are issues that all of us engage with all the time in terms of, Maybe it's not a case about conversion, it's more a case about how do we get across our work and how valuable we have found using LCT in our research or practice to audiences that may be slightly hostile because they are, or are willing to engage simply because they are overwhelmed, too busy, or it's so alien or whatever. So these are issues that I think are very general import. Um, uh, and there's a lot of experience in dealing with that sort of thing from, you know, like, um, from so many different fields, like whether it's teacher training or whether it's uh, EAP like Steve, or it's, you know, um, uh, so many other fields as well. Oh, and I just want to say, by the way, that Ken's put up uh, that these questions are being like really engaged with in a sort of deep and meaningful way at this year's uh, Australian S uh, Systemic Functional Linguistics Association conference that's being held uh, virtually, um, but run from, from uh, Brisbane, organised by Ken, and um, they put a link in the chat for those, uh, for anybody who might be interested to uh, engage with that. So, oh, by the way, there's an issue for you. Don't feel like you need to know all about SFL in order to be able to engage with that. I have no idea about like 99.9% .9 of, of SFL, but I can still engage productively with what they're saying. So don't be put off by its big technical array of concepts. So I think that's great. Thanks, Thomas. Thomas, are you, have you, is that, are you rounded there? Do you wanna, is that, is this, was this the last part? This was the last part, uh, we're out of time. And I just wanna say thank you everyone. Thank you very much for your feedback on my own talk. Uh, and thank you very much, Carl, for, um, suggesting that and we will uh definitely post these and ayumi do you have any comments no and i'm sorry my my part took so long that i 
Thomas part was became very short and I'm very sorry for that, but uh, I'm glad that uh, many uh, comments uh, about the many comments grateful about your all your comments, thank you very much for your comments and uh, Thomas for uh, bringing all that in the, this short period of time, uh, I appreciate that the call and also thank you very much for your comments so. Uh, all I want to say is thank you. Thank you. Yes. Well, thanks yeah, thank to both you. of you. Thanks yeah. to both of you from everybody. Um, and from, um, it's always a bit weird at the end of a Zoom talk because either people do that little emoji or, you know, it's, it's just kind of like a weird sort of like happy silence. But um, thanks uh, both of you. Um, and also thanks for these questions. I mean, just from the chat, these questions are relevant to people all around the world. And I think they deserve to having a wider engagement in, in this sort of thing. And people have got all sorts of different contexts in which different kinds of issues come up for uh, getting an audience for their work, which is the most important thing, you know? Um, somebody has just asked, a nationalist just asked a link to the forum. Yeah, if you go to the LCT website um, and you go to uh, the LCT website, if you go to community, and um, so if you go to social media, basically, uh, under community, so the LCT website, go to the community menu, go to social media, and it, you've got join the email forum right there, as well as you can, you know, or you can just email the LCT center, which you can find online as well, and they will be able to, oh, thanks, Corinne. She's put up the exact link to where you can join the email forum. And the recordings of roundtables are put up, um, uh, after the end of uh, a season, um, so we talk about season one and season two. So the uh, all of season one are now um, up on YouTube, and Mauricio is going to do some more advertising for those, and um, so that people know that they're there. And season two, we, unless anybody doesn't want them to uh, presenters aren't allowed to say no, uh, they can. Uh, they'll be also up on the LCT YouTube um, uh, channel as well. So I think this is, I'm looking forward to, um, to being able to you know, engage with, and I hope people will engage with these questions from all the different subfields. It's not just a national thing. It is also a subfield thing, you know, like um, science education uh, has a very different ecology to music education or history education. So engaging with those things is a real art form in itself. And in fact, you can use LCT to analyze how best to engage with your contextual specific substantive field. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Yumi. Thanks, everybody, for being here as well. Thanks, everybody. And I hope to see you all in one, two, three. It's three weeks this time. Three weeks' time for the next one. So thanks, guys. Thanks, Thomas and Yumi, for that. And keep going, LCT Japan. It only takes two people to start something. Look at Latin America is now, like, booming. At some point, you reach critical mass, and the whole thing, you know, uh, goes into uh, into you know overdrive. You never know. At some point, that just happens, um, uh, uh, and then suddenly you you don't have any time left for your own work. So just <laughs> so just you know, like <laughs> the gods punish us by granting us our wishes. <laughs> yes, we can only hope. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks for everybody. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks. Have a good one. Thank, Thank you. you.